Hello, I'm Dr. William Inman. I am, this is a short video on anterior cruciate ligament rupture repair non-surgical, the idiopathology, why it causes, what causes it, and why we treat it with what we treat it. Essentially, just a little background on myself. Um, I graduated uh, veterinary school uh, after nine years of college and was teaching veterinary surgeon. I'm a veterinary surgeon and I've made a living out of adjusting anterior cruciate ligament disease and doing surgery on anterior cruciate ligament repair for the last 35 years. Essentially, um, in graduating, my doctoral thesis was on an anterior cruciate ligament repair surgically. There are 47 different techniques at that time of anterior cruciate ligament repair surgically. As a surgeon, a surgeon basically is classically designed to, um, well, a chance to cut is a chance to cure is the, th uh, the theory behind just about anything. A surgeon like a hammer, everything is a nail. For a surgeon, everything is a potential surgery. And of course, when we have an anterior cruciate ligament condition, essentially we go in and stabilize it. There are, like I say, 47, actually more than that, different techniques of anterior cruciate rupture repair that are used in veterinary medicine. Unfortunately, <coughs> when I graduated, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> from veterinary school, you had to be able to do a couple of different kinds of these surgeries, even to graduate, even if you're going into turtle animal, turtle animal medicine. And so uh, essentially there were a lot of surgeons in 1979 that were graduating, and that's fine. However, subsequently, there have been less and less and less people that are able to do live surgery on animals in veterinary school. They get a chance to watch it, but they don't get a chance to do it. And so the number of veterinary surgeons doing this technique has decreased, decreased, decreased. And the only people that really do it now are board certified veterinary surgeons. Now, in reference to them, these are amazing practitioners who basically are excellent surgeons. And their job is to architecturally change the knee of the canine is such that it eliminates or ameliorates clinical disease conditions. In the last 10 years, 15 years particularly, um, a particular series of anterior cruciate rupture repairs have focused on the, uh, the, the theory that the anterior angle or the angle of the knee essentially is compromised. So here's the knee of the canine and this angle on the tibia, this is the tibia and this is the femur essentially, has basically been compromised and so they go in and replane it or actually re uh, 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 do an osteotome and essentially readjust the angle on the uh, uh, tibial plateau, making it less uh, and, uh, uh, forward leaning. It's as though God created the tibia of the canine incorrectly. <clears throat> The TPLO and TTA surgeries are basically designed to do that, and they've been uh, taken over essentially uh, as the techniques for the long, several years that is the, uh, uh, the approach to taking care of this. However, they're fraught with lots of different postoperative infections. It's never really been proven that the tibial plateau was incorrect, although they'll point to all kinds of, of uh, uh, research articles that suggest that's a condition. However, the interesting thing about it is the primary condition that causes this disease condition is not directed towards regardless of what technique that we went into, essentially 60 to 80 percent of these animals would recur on the on the contralateral leg and we would suggest it would suggest that they were favoring the leg we did successfully surgery on essentially and they're favoring the other leg and it would blow out. However, um, animals essentially that would suggest that if uh, the animals that we did surgery on were ambulatory and walking normally on that leg within a couple weeks after surgery and so they weren't favoring that leg, but still the other leg would blow out 60-80% of the time. And that would indicate that the problem is further upstream, and of course it is. The condition actually exists where we have a, a phenomenon of a neurological interference, which we were able to determine utilizing adjusting de uh, technologies called the VOM technology. And of course, we would f go through these animals and we would find that they would have reflexive patterns, wink, uh, that would occur at the um, L4-5 area in every one of these animals that had anterior cruciate ligament rupture repair. Now, a real short uh, a neurological lesson here, essentially, if that is in fact the situation, then if we were to go ahead and whether we treat the animal w that has had surgery with this condition or basically treat the animal without surgery, the contralateral leg doesn't get involved. It goes from 60 to 80 percent down to 3 percent, indicating the primary reason, essentially, is this neurological interference. And let's examine this neurological interference because the neurological interference at the L4-5 area will actually compromise the nerves that fire off the vastus lateralis. That's the, that's the muscle that comes down the outside of the thigh, essentially, and extends at the knee. The quadriceps mechanism, there's a vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, rectus femoris, and vastus intermedius, essentially, that are all involved here. But the vastus lateralis is the one that is fired off by the L4-5 subluxation phenomenon, and, or by the L4-5 area. And if it's compromised, and it is compromised in the neurological interference, essentially, then what happens is you have the vastus lateralis, or the one on the lateral side of the knee, essentially, 
getting a D where the rest of the the uh, uh, um, the rest of the um, uh, quadriceps mechanism is getting an A. So the rectus femoris and vastus intermedius and vastus medialis essentially are working correctly, but the lateralis is not. And um, because of that, we have an unbalanced uh, uh, knee problem. And actually, when the body <clears throat> extends at the knee, then we have internal rotation, and it's that internal rotation continually that breaks down the medial collateral. I'm sorry, medial collateral ligament and the anterior cruciate ligament of the knee, and eventually it can break. And people will suggest, well, gosh, he was jumping out of the car the other day or jumping from the back of the truck, and that's what caused the problem. Well, no. The, it was basically set up by the fact that it had been broken down over a long period of time with this unbalanced quadriceps mechanism. And our attempt to try to take care of this condition without addressing the L45 subluxation or vertebral interference, essentially, is going to be fraught with um, temporary, um, temporary benefits and the other leg will blow out. So whether we do surgery successfully on the blown out knee or not, we basically will adjust the L45 area because that's what's in fact going on essentially in holding the problem in place. Now we can do that with the adjusting device, which basically is a series of VOM therapies, and that has a, a good effect essentially. Or we can do it with um, laser therapy, which we've used for a long period of time. Let me see if I can get this one to work. We can take this laser, essentially, and put it down the, the area at the proper protocols, essentially, and use this laser. We're not using this laser anymore, although it's been effective. Essentially, um, it's a red-violet laser, and it's set right now for um, this particular series of protocols involving rehabilitation of the knee and also rehabilitation of the area of the spine, essentially. And so that's one of the ones that we have used. However, now what we do is we use a frequency-specific laser therapy a device that basically allows us to, to treat the, the condition in this fashion. The combination of uh, adjusting and laser has about a 90% uh, success rate, essentially, and that's a good thing, essentially. When we use just the adjustment alone, we've got about a 65% uh, chances of solving this problem, and it also it'll, it'll avoid the one on the other side, so it's always indicated. And we use the, uh, the adjusting device and myofascial release, which I don't have here on the table, essentially uh, we have about a 70% chance of benefit. When we use all of them together, we have 90% uh, success. With just the laser alone, we're sitting at about 80%, and this is based on treating hundreds and hundreds of cases over the last, what, 25 years. But we're aggressively using this particular laser, essentially this particular laser, uh, as a means to treat uh, it by itself, but also we use it with the VOM technology. It's important to understand that um, this particular uh, technology, uh, we've tried to publish several times, and it's very difficult to provide this. In the United States last year, $2.2 billion were spent on surgeries for the knee. And trying to publish um, a technology that bypasses that is, is politically, well, I'll let you make your uh, conclusions there. It's politically very difficult, and I understand that. I have nothing against the surgery. However, it would be nice to basically address this condition, whether we're going to do surgery or not, to try to keep the other leg from blowing out. When I started doing this, when I stopped doing the surgery in the 1990s and early 2000s, essentially, the cost of the surgery is about $1,800, and now it's about four to six thousand dollars and going up. The fact that you spend four to six thousand dollars in this surgery, TPLO, TTA surgeries, essentially, which are not really in vogue that much anymore, but um, are still done and then have to turn around and, and pay for it again on the other leg within six to eight months at a 60 to 80 percent uh, incidence rate is not okay essentially and so um, it becomes prohibitively expensive and I appreciate the fact that it is in fact prohibitive uh, uh, it is particularly expensive because of that people are searching and will search for this uh, video essentially for a non-surgical approach and trying to take care of this the nice thing about the surgery is such that that it can always be done, regardless of what your surgeon tells you. We can open this joint up, and the joint is amazing too, because you can open it up and take any osteo osteoarthritic changes that occur because you waited out of there and be give you a brand new joint. So um, what we do with this technology is we apply it for anywhere from three, three weeks, essentially, and we should, inside of seven to 10 days, get a significant benefit. The animal is bearing weight more often, etc., cetera, and, and, and looking like it's going to resolve the problem. Or it doesn't, and if it doesn't, then after six weeks and we don't get a response that we're happy with, we just do the surgery. And then, of course, we treat the, uh, the L4-5 area in the lower back that, that basically is involved with uh, this condition to try to keep the other leg from blowing out. And the incidence rates drops from 60 to 80% down to 3%.
which is not okay. When um, somebody approaches me and wanted, wants me to do surgery on their leg, I suggest that we try this at first and see what happens in seven to 10 days. We either know that we're gonna win or we don't, usually three weeks. Um, we'll say, okay, let's go ahead and do surgery on that leg. But the problem is, is uh, the expense level essentially is, is a consideration anymore. And so because of that, we want to uh, exhaust this. I mean, we can spend $500, $600 in therapies using the laser and this and that to determine whether or not we can repair the knee, have the body repair the knee. The laser doesn't really cure the animal. The animal cures itself. All we're doing is we're inducing the connective tissue, bone connective tissue, uh, cartilage, and ligaments in the knee to basically repair itself. And the whole idea is to stop that internal rotation. If we stop the, the subluxation that's unbalancing the internal rotation, either with the laser or with the, uh, the adjusting technology, we're taking the stress off of that knee and giving it a chance to heal. Now that's the good news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is for anywhere from two to three months, this dog basically has to move and, and basically not be excessively exercised, jumping down from things, and God forbid there's another dog in the house. I always ask the client if there's another dog in the house, essentially, because if there is, at about two and a half to three weeks, this dog will start to feel well enough to start wrestling with its brother, and then we'll, all of a sudden the dog's three-legged again, and we have to start from scratch. Sometimes we just, at that point, just say, let's just do surgery, as opposed to try to keep the other dogs away. So we want to know if there's another dog involved, and also we want to know if the dog is prone to run up and down stairs. Like I say, at about two and a half to three weeks when we're winning with the laser and the VOM combination, essentially the dog feels good enough to chase a squirrel in the backyard or race to the front door and bark at the UPS guy, which can in fact blow that uh, knee out. So we want to make sure that the animal has is TLC'd for at least two to three months. At that point, the knee has stabilized itself and is probably stronger than it's ever been before because of connective tissue uh, 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 proliferation associated with stabilizing the knee. So this is the approach that we use for treating anterior cruciate ligament rupture without surgery. And like I say, we have, if we use a combination of this particular laser, come on, this particular laser, um, and or the adjusting device, essentially, our success rate is relatively high. Some of the animals that have had conditions or previous surgeries on the other leg that may not be as effective. Also, if we have a giant breed like a St. Bernard or um, some other um, uh, bull mastiff, essentially, those dogs essentially are hard to keep them uh, under control, and so a surgery may be indicated with them. But again, we don't come back and take care of the L45 area, essentially in the lower back, that neurological interference that holds this problem in place, then we're going to have to do that surgery on the other leg. And of course, it's expensive. This is not a criticism for surgeons, God bless them, um, because their job is to fix the broken uh, condition. However, the primary problem exists in the back, and if we don't address that, then um, we're not going to uh, ultimately get uh, this taken care of. We would like for the body to resolve this problem on, on their own without having to go in and put in plates and and implants and bones and or um, pins and wires etc to try to stabilize stabilize that knee is about any time we open up the joint it's never going to be as good as it was before mother nature knows how to fix itself essentially if we can just get out of the way and um, uh, handle the underlying problem that, can, that takes care of this condition for those of you who don't have um, this technology my advice would be to latch on to it because it uh, will pay for itself inside of weeks essentially you can contact me area code 208 Six four zero three four three zero, or email me at Dr. Bill at Vomtech. That's V O M T E C H dot com, and we'll be happy to um, give you some more information. For those of you who are trying to get your dog treated with this type of technology, there are practitioners, hopefully in your area. If not, these technologies are all available to anyone who wants to take them on. They can contact me, and I can give them more information. I appreciate your patience in listening to me about this technology. There's again no criticism for um, the previous. Uh, veterinary surgeons who deal with this condition all the time. However, because the cost of surgery, essentially more people are looking to a non-surgical approach to taking care of this problem as opposed to invest anywhere from six to twelve twelve thousand dollars to get their dog's knees taken care of. They may have paid fifteen hundred dollars for a puppy and now they've got uh, an extensive expense on their hands, which in this day and age may not be um, a good situation all the way around. Thank you very much. And now I get to go answer the telephone for somebody's calling me about this particular disease condition. Thank you very much and have a great day. So Dr. Inman, can I help you? Yellow. Oh uh, yes, hello. Yellow.